there's so much of a deeper level to being Filipino. The principal said, oh, I think our population is between 95 and 98 percent Filipino. I think Filipino identity is something, it's something imposed and it's something that many here struggle against. There's how much of that resonates back into my being Filipino. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Manuel and I am the Chief Operating Officer of PhillyFest. For today's second release of Digital PhillyFest, I will also be your host for today's identity panel. Um, we will be joined by three lovely people who are currently in three different time zones. We will be joined by Troy, Carlo and Janelle to discuss the topic of deconstructing Filipino. So, yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Troy Kabida. I started writing poems when I was 15 years old um, during year 10 because I thought I was going through heartache. <laughs> but then as you develop, you take your art seriously and you realize how much of that is actually like really constructive to your development as a person. And then slowly you realize how much when you dive into poetry, as, as you do with every art form, you realize how much of that shaped your viewpoint of your identity. And in this case, Poetry helps me understand what it means to be Filipino. So, hello, uh, I'm Carlo Antonio Galay David. Right now, my work is focused on historical writing to write the city's history. And along the way, I read about the history of the southern part of the Philippines and all the complications behind it. Greetings from Toronto, Canada. Uh, my name is Jenna Lee. I try to build bridges between Canadian educators and Filipino families so that way they can understand each other better. I would just like to quickly elaborate on the theme of this panel and what do I mean about deconstructing Filipino and why is it important to discuss in the first place? And I think this panel will definitely be useful for those of us who are trying to understand um, the Filipino identity a bit more and like what Troy said, that there's so much of a deeper level to being Filipino, to be feeling Filipino and that there's so many nuances and cultural identities and, you know, um, indigenous I like ethnicities as well. So whether personally or culturally, no one Filipino experience is the same. Start off with you, Troy. We can talk about Lad Lad or the whole premise of Word of as a whole. Cool. So um, in May of 2020, um, my debut poetry pamphlet called Word of was published with um, poetry press called Bad Betty Press. And it's um, a series of poems that highlight basically the first year of my life after coming out of the closet as bisexual and what that means, um, what that, how the experience was shaped because I was Filipino and how it was received through family and friends and communities and how that affected my growth as not only as a person but as a writer. And the first poem that I, that I, was, I had put in the book was called Lad Lad and um, it was basically my way of chewing the word on the word Lad Lad because in Tagalog Colloquially, lad lad means is the word we use to talk about coming out of the closet. And I spoke to my dad about the whole concept in Tagalog, and then we were using the word lad lad to talk about that. And I was like, after the conversation, I was like, that's a very interesting word to talk about coming out. Because in English, when we talk about coming out of the closet, the imagery that pops in my head isn't very, it's a lot more gentle than lad lad. Because lad lad, when you talk about it, is, is, there's a very forceful nature about it. I tell you right now, from my experiences, whenever we use the word lad lad in any context, it's always through a joke or there's always um, a punchline about it. And it's not as, I don't know, maybe careful as I would expect it to be. So I sat on that for a long time and then I wrote a poem about it as, as any writer would do. <laughs> and um, yeah, very interesting. And I was glad to have performed that in Philly Fest. And, I, and what you said about, you know, lad lad is a word that sort of seems kind of not as gentle as the, the term coming out. Yeah. 
it does seem like you know something to expose that's what it basically yeah exactly you know, generally means and there is something kind of like this bruteness to it it's also a testament to just how we've been using it in terms of our conversations you know like whenever someone says like oh he's come out of the closet oh nagladlad na siya and it's like <laughs> there's, a, there's a difference in the emotional weight that you're receiving in english and tagalog i'm not sure because i'm not i'm not white i'm not english or american so i don't know the i don't have an intimate relationship with that but with if you compare it to tagalog it's a bit more it's a bit heavier yeah it is a bit heavier you, yeah so you, you don't know how to take it well without getting truly offended because i feel like <laughs> I have to be a little upset about it. How does being a Filipino and identifying yourself as bisexual manifest mm-hmm. in your work? Like um It's a lot of conversation. So <laughs> I mean the whole the whole point of me being a poet is already a conversation in itself with Filipinos because I was like, so what's really your job? <laughs> <laughs> like I thought I'm a writer and then I'm a library assistant and they were like, okay, so you're a librarian. It goes, no, 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 no. I'm a writer and I'm a library assistant. So it's your passion. It's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a conversation and it's, um, you, you settle on that thought for a while and then you realize why is it so hard for sort of the, I don't know, the conventional Filipinos ought to accept <laughs> Filipinos as writers. And then I would ask, I, 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 it was a big problem of mine when I started as a writer. None of my Filipino friends would go to, to my shows. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I was like, why don't you want to go? Am I that bad? And then they wouldn't say anything. And then one of them told me, it's because we're not comfortable with poetry. Like, it's not, it's not, it's a foreign concept to us. And we're not sure how to take it well. That they're always afraid of not understanding it. And I'm like, that's kind of, part of the process you don't have to truly understand it and it's just then it goes back to the concept to how you know poetry is always seen as this elitist art and that's how I saw it growing up and then it took me living in London for me to realize it's actually not the environment of it is also quite changing because that there's people like you you know who's um, going out there producing work following their passion and you know setting an example for you know people who grew up in the uh you know in the uk and as like first generation or second generation to pursue different things to pursue more creative side of things yeah i think that like the dynamic is sort of like starting to change a bit as well yeah i mean that's also i i was tech i was thinking about that was a and it's great and i'm very grateful to to be in this situation but also i can't talk about this without expressing the fact that there's a level of privilege in my circumstances as to why i have the time and the effort yeah. to be this way like a lot of people will say that you know just just pursue your dream just do it if you want to do it just do it i'm like yeah but also you have to understand that there's more levels to that it's not just waking up and doing it <laughs> yeah i also resonated a lot with phonetic i really liked phonetic <laughs> i guess i just wanted to ask you more about the relationship you have with tagalog with mm-hmm. your language and english so maybe you can elaborate on that as well yeah cuz i was born in the philippines and i moved to the uk in 2007 so i was 12 years old it's quite unfortunate you grow up in the philippines especially where i'm from and, and um, you're not taught to foster um, an intimate relationship with your language you're always pushed to to prioritize english because that's the job that's the language that gets you more job opportunities and has set you up on a more higher status socially and then when i got to the uk <laughs> i was like oh being filipino is not a universal thing like you <laughs> like no one not everyone's not a filipino you've got you've got a lot of different things and then you realize that as you grow older being filipino has informed a lot of who i am as a person to the point where my relationship with english is informed by my relationship with tagalog so whenever i speak english i get tired and i go back to thinking in tagalog and speaking tagalog i mean i joke about it but it's like it's a bit of a fact and um yeah that the poem phonetic is just me chewing on my relationship with Tagalog because at that point when I was writing the poem I was just starting to dig into it and a lot of what we consider as fact and a universal thing yeah. is actually very intrinsic specifically to being Filipino and I find so much beauty in that yeah and also like that last part where you said according to my father this is why yeah. those can laugh through floods and I love that part because um it's through language that you sort of just captured like that 
Filipino attitude. You know, mm-hmm. like you captured the Filipino attitude in this poem. And mm-hmm. I was just like really interested in that, you know, your experience with um, the dialogue and English and you coming yeah. here. Um, how old were you when you came to the UK? I was 12. You were 12. So you were yeah. like, you know, um, you're already like well versed in like the Tagalog you spoke but yeah. I came here when I was five so I have like a little like I forget a lot of um, you know how to speak the Tagalog but I'm like starting to learn it again um, mm-hmm. and so that's why like I really love this poem and I think it mm-hmm. resonates with a lot of people as well who's trying to um, you know trying to rediscover that relationship with their, yeah. their language mm-hmm. so yeah War Dove is just, it's a, a baby of mine. I wrote it for two years and the poems are about, you know, what it's like to come out of the closet and afterwards. Because I realized early on, as soon as I came out of the closet, it's not actually coming out. That's the hardest. It's living afterwards and understanding how to navigate the tectonic plates that shift after that. Because, you know, a lot of that, a lot of the experience is about trying to re- reconcile with relationship with people and yourself because you're, go- you're growing to a different person essentially. And one last question, Kiko. What does, uh, from your experiences, from mm-hmm. your work as a creative producer, mm-hmm. what does deconstructing the Filipino identity mean to you? So as a creative producer, I've been producing Poetry Nights from April 2017. And actually, um, a majority of the work that I do is with Somalis. And um, I'm the only Filipino in a group called Poetry Insha. So we produce poetry nights um, bi-monthly. And we promote open mic nights and spoken word and just promoting poetry, especially poetry from people of color and queer, queer poets and female poets, because we believe they deserve a space and a platform to amplify their voices. As a Filipino, it's interesting getting to learn about different cultures in an intimate space and how much of that even though we're coming from different countries and different languages and different cultures how much of that resonates back into my being Filipino I still haven't produced anything about being Filipino just yet because it's just a matter of um, logistics and just getting my head creatively around it but you know being doing poetry in Shah I've done a poetry night called Poems for Boys and um it was a <laughs> it was a poetry night giving platform to male identifying poets to give space and talk about their experiences of being what it means to be a man and sexuality and faith and work and emotions and stuff like that. And that was a response to a lot of Filipino friends of mine who were guys who made fun of me after coming out of the closet. It's a, it's a process and I, I'm grateful. He's yeah, part- there's a lot of us creatives out there. There's a lot of Filipino creatives in the UK. It's just a matter of putting Fine. myself in one space. And, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So next up, we have Carlo Antonio Galay David. Did I say that correctly? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a bit more about your research on Kidapan local history? And also, if you could um, explain to, for those who may not know about where Kidapan is geographically yeah. in the Philippines yeah. and about its local community as well, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. So I think it's quite telling that uh, a lot of us don't know where Kidapa, places like Kidapawan is. No? Uh, that is, I think, the picture throughout the Philippines. We know very few local places in the Philippines. We only know the big cities, uh, Manila, Metro Manila, Cebu, maybe Iloilo, maybe Davao City, but the rest we're completely clueless. And that's where most of us come from. So uh, my at- approach to this topic would be to discuss that, that I think we need to talk about being Filipino as being people coming from these locales. No, so, but a bit about my background, uh, my research is on the history of the town of Kidapawan. Kidapawan is in the province of North Cotabato, which is in Mindanao, you know, which is the part of the Philippines we know very little about, the, the Philippines knows very little about. and. What I've basically been doing is trying to understand how the people of the town came to that town, how the different phases of Philippine history have shaped the town. Are the stories we hear on the national level the same on the local level? Uh, Are the bad guys also bad guys on the local level? Are the good guys also good guys on the local level? And it's interesting 
because while I'm doing that, I'm also asking questions from fellow local historians. And the stories, the perspectives you hear are quite diverse. And I think you realize something which I think we need to acknowledge. Now that uh, first and foremost, Filipino identity isn't this one single uh, homogeneous thing. It's actually quite diverse. And any idea that it's something monolithic, single, is, I think, contrived. And the, I think the best word, uh, approaching it historically, we must, I, I think, first acknowledge that Philippine identity is contrived. The Philippines is an invented country. Before the Spaniards came to the Philippines, there was no such thing as the Philippines. There were many different islands with many different cultures. And the Philippine identity was invented as a matter of convenience for colonial powers. It becomes interesting here in Mindanao because the Spaniards, the first colonizers, never really reached this this far. Kidapawan did not have a Spanish history. Uh, and I had to approach the town's history from that uh, perspective. Okay, I have to do research the history of uh, the Spanish in the, in the city. To my shock, I realized, wait, they, did, they never reached this far. So I had to completely reorient the way I looked at the Philippines vis-a-vis my locale. Uh, and then when the Americans came, of course, they kept that idea of a single Filipino identity. Make, it makes it easier for them to manage the colony. But when the Treaty of Paris was signed, it included Mindanao. Problem was, the Spaniards sold them an island that they didn't really own. So they, the, the Americans had to conquer Mindanao all over again. So that has actually a history of violence, which is very easy to forget. And uh, we have to remember that because especially here in Mindanao, that's the root cause of much of the violence and conflict that we still sometimes hear. So there, I think Filipino identity is something, to be blunt, in, the, in, the, in this part of uh, the Philippines, it's something imposed. It's something imposed and it's something that many here struggle against. Uh, Idapawan's population, Mindanao's population can roughly be divided into three peoples. Uh, you have the indigenous peoples, you know, uh, then you have the indigenous groups which are Islamized, they're called Moros. And then you have the settlers who were brought in by the Philippine government uh, in the successive history of resettlement uh, in, 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 into Mindanao. And I'm one of those uh, people, most of them are Christians. So these three different peoples, different languages, different cultures, different religions, they have a long violent history living in the same island. and. Where Philippine identity comes in there is somewhere very sensitive, delicate. So if you ask Christians a Moro, are you a Filipino? You won't get a straightforward answer. You say, uh, does being Filipino involve being a Catholic? Does it be involve having to eat pork? Does it involve talking in Tagalog? No? And uh, there are complications, which I, are very much a reality in this part of the Philippines. Uh, and my research has been to show how that developed, how that affected uh, the town's history, and how that either caused violence and conflict, or that also caused an enrichment of the society, where I think the society emerges better than, say, a locale like Manila or Cebu. I, you know what? Everything that you said about um, the Filipino identity as something that's imagined is something that I'm also very interested in as well. And deconstruction, I think, is an idea of like decolonialization it as is, well. It is, it is. And we always, like for us in the context of the diaspora, we associate being Filipino as something to be prideful of and something that mm -hmm. we should be proud of. But we're, I wouldn't say that we're less informed and maybe that makes us ignorant of the fact that you know that the Filipino identity is like is very nuanced and that in the national context that it still has you know um, like many many problems with like there's loads of clashes of other identities of cultures and ethnicities that's not necessarily represented with like with enough justice with enough um, you know and I guess that obviously purely comes off from you know we have Manila as capital and has been perpetuated as the capital and we associate with a lot of those images more 
Well, I think with the experience of the diaspora, what I would like to see more. I, I understand this struggle to learn how to uh, love your roots as Filipinos, yeah. but then that ends up that you end up falling into the temptation of believing that the Philippines is a simple thing that you just have to go back to and understand. In fact, it's much more complicated. I think. It would be much better if uh, expats, if uh, people in the diaspora, Filipinos who grew up outside of the Philippines, embrace that complexity instead of shy away from it. You know, uh, we have a very complicated history. We have a very complicated set of identities, and rather than insist, oh, we're all just Filipino. No, you <clears throat> discover who you are, where you come from. Usually, many of us have uh, mixed ethnicities. Yeah, of course. Usually, we have parents from different hometowns. That I think only means that we have more to discover. When the Americans came and said, "Okay, we need to rule this whole the, these islands as one," they basically chose Manila, the Philippine identity, for, uh, imagined from Manila in the Tagalog area, and said everything else needs to go. So that includes Negros, which had its own republic. That included the Sultan of Sumagindana, which that included Zamboanga, and that didn't only mean something political it meant something cultural so those who were speaking chavacano were slowly discouraged you have to learn english because it was the american colonial language but you also have to learn tagalog filipino which was the national language everything else was inconvenient and just complicated things and i think i wouldn't use the word i think i would use the word mediocrity if we don't overcome that and we don't discover the roots I think many of us are always, you know, like trying to chase, like trying to rediscover. And it's so nice to have, like, to hear about your research because it's beginning to get deconstructing and decolonializing into the picture, especially for people like us who grew up in, in a different country. You know, I think it's just something that we can all start to think about. Um, I understand the hesitation. I get that a lot of people are hesitant yeah. because it's they are they're, they're afraid of the complexity. And, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to ask myself if I'm a Chamacano or a Nilocano <laughs> or a Filip- I'm just Filipino, and then they don't proceed from there. But I think there, na you have a lot to discover. And yeah, the idea of that is just I think really amazing as well. Like it's something that we shouldn't shy away from. And I totally you agree. Shouldn't, with you shouldn't. You shouldn't. And each of these places has a story. Yeah. Each of these places have unique cultural idiosyncrasies just waiting for you to. And when we talk about Filipino pride outside of the Philippines, uh, I get at least from what I from what I see, you know, uh, the Filipino pride that I see doesn't reflect that complexity. And I don't want that to be reflected. I, I don't want the Chavacanos to be proud. Oh, look at me! We have this in our hometown. Look at us! I'm actually in Davao City. But I talk a lot about my hometown to the town. So in the microcosm, I'm a bit of an expat too, but it's just two hours away from the city. So, yeah. uh, but I do it in a way that people actually think I'm in Kidapawan. And when they find out, oh, you're in Davao. Like, oh. <laughs> so that maybe is the challenge for for people living outside of the Philippines. Maybe try to fool people. <laughs> you're actually living in London. No, you're, I'm actually in London. No, so that's the challenge to, to know, to get to know these towns, these, these places. Cebu, uh, Ilocos or in Ilocos? Ilocos North. Or is your in Ilocos North? Yeah. So, uh, get to know that place too. And the food in these places, I mean, you know, uh, if you want to talk about culture, it's a food. Yeah. And we don't really see as much uh, of the complexity of Filipino cuisines that we should be seeing outside of the Philippines. So, rediscover Chavacano cuisine, rediscover Ilocano cuisine. Yeah. The construction for us is a reality. It's, it falls apart here. Yeah. Uh, it hasn't really cemented the way it has in places like uh, Cebu or in Manila. Yeah. Here in, in our parts, we, we don't exactly feel this thing called Philippine identity. Yeah. Because you know, we, we, we have realities that if we talk about them to the to the rest of the country, the, the country wouldn't understand. They don't wouldn't yeah. care. Yeah. Uh, maybe we could um, talk about that idea of like in Kidapawan actually, mm-hmm. where the local community can you say like goes against the grain of an idea of Filipino identity. Maybe you could elaborate. Okay, here's a 
a very concrete demonstration. Uh, the indigenous peoples of Kidapawan are called Obomonobo. Uh, a, a typical Obomonobo can speak four or five languages. So they can speak uh, their language, Obomonobo. They can speak Cebuano, which is the lingua franca of the place. They can speak Hiligaynon, which is the lingua franca of neighboring towns. Uh, many of them can, uh, they can speak Tagalog because they're required to learn in school. So there's already four. And they have to learn English, right? That's five. Some of them even pick up foreign languages like Chinese, Korean, and so uh, multilingualism is a reality in the town, especially for the indigenous peoples. But and the perspectives that that brings into uh, their thinking, you know, each language has a different perspective, and the more languages you speak, the more perspectives you have. Uh, in the the education system is colonial, so all of those perspectives are ignored, and they have to learn. For instance, in idioms, they have to learn only the Tagalog idioms. And you get a lot of uh, Obomanobo parents complaining, why aren't you learning the tribe's uh, idioms anymore? It's not taught in school. It's not correct. It's not Filipino. It's, it's, it's only Manobo. It's not Filipino. So you have that com complexity. Uh, we also have a Maguindanaon population, a, a Moro Maguindanaon population. And they've had a very violent history. They're still really recovering from what they went through in the 1970s. And what they went through is not discussed. Not in the city, not in, even in their own communities, not in the country. So, as a historian... Is it's well my, not discussed? Educationally, sir? In the uh, no, it's, it's not even recorded. Like, I found a certain barangay which saw a massacre of uh, 15 civilians, including small children. They were slaughtered. The, the government under Marcos slaughtered them. So I I only heard about the incident by accident because somebody casually mentioned it. So I had to go all the way to that remote town, to that remote uh, barangay, and talk to the surviving uh, relatives. So And then I found out it was completely erased from history. Your, your family, did you get justice? No, you didn't get justice. Uh, were you remunerated? No, you weren't even remunerated. It was as if the, the dead were erased from the records. And it was ignored. And I found out that there were four other such situations just in the town alone. The province saw at least 100 such massacres. And they were all erased. This is 1970s, okay? This isn't something far off into the, ninth, into the 19th or 18th century. This is something very like 1970s. But it was ignored. It was forgotten. And that's, I think, where some of the resentment against Filipino nation comes from. That our experiences, no matter how life-threatening, no matter how serious and dire, they're ignored. So that's for one community. For the indigenous peoples, there are practices which are discouraged by the nation-state. Uh, the Obamonovo typically do not have a family name, for instance. They're very, very basic. Uh, they do not have a family name. They just have a single name. But the government of the colonial uh, capital insisted that all Filipinos, quote-unquote Filipinos, had to have a given name and a family name. So they required the Manobo to invent a family name. So most of them used the names of their fathers as family name. But then that, it didn't stop there. They were told, your family, your names sound uncivilized. They don't sound Filipino. So somebody named Lumiok was renamed Romeo because his name wasn't Filipino enough. Lumiok wasn't Filipino enough. It, it sounded too savage, so they had to give him the very colonial name Romeo. But these are realities. And right now, Romeo's children are asking, why was my father's name changed? So, and they're fighting back. They're starting to give their children names which were uh, more indigenous than what was accepted and there's still resistance to that you know uh, you still get school saying why why is your name like that why, why does your name sound funny sort of that ingrained already in the it's so sad it's so, yeah, it, yeah it, it's ingrained like and i guess you also see that a bit of that in colonial areas especially with the tension between spanish and american coloniality you know when you have a name which is spanish sounding uh, atanasia uh, Roberta, they would laugh at you. Your your name sounds like an old woman. Your name sounds like an old man. <laughs> mm. Like you should have an Americanized name, like Rosalind or 
no? yeah. so uh, and you get that sense but on the indigenous level here in Mindanao here in Kidapawan uh, and it's painful it's rather it's quite painful no, to see that these time honored traditions are disappearing just because people think it's not civilized and colonial so that's one dimension to it yeah no Carla thank you so much for sharing us um about this history about the mm-hmm. idea of small pockets of resistance this idea of the filipino nation or nationhood is already imagined in the first place and it just perpetuated across history um it was the writer benedict anderson i think i don't know if you've read his work imagine communities imagine uh, no i might take yeah, this, that this, this writer named benedict anderson came up with that uh that nationhood is actually a 19th century invention yeah of course uh, it, was, it, it, it emerged from the west and uh per, it was perpetuated by uh during his time to sprint you know, but basically the whole ideological state apparatus and it served to exclude a lot of uh, local identities you're in the uk i guess this is something the british understand yeah. the welsh and the scots and the you know that's the same with the philippines the bc shows you know, whatever this is going to be british yeah. that's also the same questions that are being asked in the philippines yeah and i think we're not hearing these questions enough yeah we're not i definitely not so i'm going to stop there but carlo thank you so much and i hope that we can you know continue this some form or another in a, maybe in a different panel yes, or yes. whatever <laughs> um so why don't we move on to you generally What is it to be Filipino, but in a Filipino-Canadian context? Yeah, sure. Here in Canada, the Filipinos really started coming here in the 1960s. Uh, they mostly came as garment workers and as nurses. And so ever since then, the community has just been growing and growing and growing. Now we are the fastest growing population in Canada. And it is, I don't know if there's a single place in Canada that doesn't have a Filipino in it. Um, at this point, imagine some of the schools here in, here in Toronto, the principal said, oh, I think our population is between 95 and 98% Filipino right now in Canada, in Toronto. So this population is growing really, really fast. Uh, I'm really proud to say we have a very strong creative community here. Um, in Toronto and um, a lot of people that are really pushing about like political issues, indigenous issues, um, a lot of really good community organizers are even like young ones are coming up right now straight out of university and they're getting like spot like mentorship from the older generations. It's, it's really nice to see in the last couple of years there's been a huge I guess like embracing of the Filipino community identity which is so nice. I remember When I first moved to Toronto, um, my first job after grad school was becoming a settlement worker in schools. So if you don't know what that is, a settlement worker in schools is like, it's like a guidance counselor, but only for newcomer students. And so because I'm Filipino, they would put me often in really Filipino schools, which made sense. But at the time, I didn't speak Tagalog, so it was It was like the, the day I got the job was the day I started Tagalog lesson. So, nayon marono ko mag Tagalog. <laughs> yeah, yay! Um, Nagarono ko mabuti talaga. But it's um, it's something that I I really needed to do quickly and for the students. Um, so fast forward six years after six years of bouncing around to different schools and helping out a lot of students and parents try to figure out the system i was like okay what i'm doing here is not big enough i need to be on a larger scale because when you are a school center worker you're only in a few schools a week like three maybe and i thought no i need i need to do something bigger than this and so at first i started doing research projects so my first job out of that was doing a research project basically Um, the York Center for Asian Research, they said, okay, what is it about the Filipino community in Canada that the longer we're here with the generations passing, it seems like the worse we do. We're, we're the only uh, population in Canada that we actually earn less than our parents. We attain less educationally than our parents. 
what happened? Every other immigrant group goes up, they earn more, they attain more academically, but the Can Filipino Canadians don't. And so we thought, okay, let's, let's do this project. And so we studied Filipinos all across Canada to figure it out. And one of the main reasons was role models. They said we didn't have any role models in like the communities that we want to be in London, uh, academically, professionally. Um, here in Canada and a lot of places in, uh, I would say a lot of places around the world. Uh, Filipinos, as you know, are mostly in nursing positions, a lot of healthcare positions. Um, right now with COVID, you see so many Filipinos, right, in frontline jobs. And is that what the students want to be when they're older? Not always, right? And so who are they looking to for role models? Um, and knowing that, I thought, okay, how can I communicate this kind of thing to teachers? And so I started Filipino Talks, which is basically like the really what I do is I make teachers cry honestly I make teachers <laughs> cry <laughs> and so I I go in there with first right what I do is straight up very very basic stuff um really really when I'm doing Filipino talks uh sometimes we have to start really at the very very basic um so I teach them about even really basic stuff like this this is something super simple right most filipinos know that in canada they're gonna say tagalo or tagalog <laughs> do you speak tagalog <laughs> and so really really basic stuff we have to start like telling them at the beginning of the beginning uh sometimes with teachers what they don't know um even like when we're thinking about languages right this was one school here in toronto we asked the students, what languages do you speak? Where are you from in the Philippines? And this was where the whole diaspora in that school was from. And most teachers, like what Carla was saying, most teachers were thinking that students were only from Manila. They only speak Tagalog, that's it. Yeah. And so we really have to kind of push the envelope with this, uh, with the educators. So that way they can understand why it's so hard for like a Bisaya newcomer, when they come to a school in Canada, most of the students will be Tagalog only. And so mm -hmm. it's really hard for them because they have to learn English, also French, and Tagalog at the same time. Mm -hmm. I have surveyed a thousand Filipino students. So before before I come into a school um, and I speak to the teachers, what I do is I give a survey out to all of the students and we ask them like, how long have you been in Canada? How long were you separated from your mom, your dad? How happy are you in Canada? What can your school do better for you? And I present all that back to the teachers. So whatever the teachers are seeing is really from their school. So here is just um, something that a lot of teachers don't realize, how many single mother families there are here in Canada and what kind of impact that will have on the Filipino students. So yeah, that is basically what Filipino Talks is. Um, teaching teachers really like, what is our community experience like? Why is it the way it is? Utang naluok, we talk about that. Remittances, talk about that. Shadism. Um, a lot of different things um, about the community and now so moving forward from Filipino talks to writing was was like okay what are some resources that these teachers can have that would help the Filipino students in their school because there really are not any Filipino uh, teen fiction books that students have here that are, is based here in Canada and is written by a Filipino. For instance, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um, there was a writer and you don't find out until page 70 that her, his character is Pinoy. And the reason why is because she opens the fridge and in the fridge is her favorite Filipino food. Oh. And that's the only reason why you find out she's Pinoy. There's no other, it's not <laughs> like she speaks Tagalog or Ilocano, Bisay or anything. It's just she opens the fridge, there's Filipino food and she closes the fridge. Yun lang. So you're like, really? <laughs> that's it? There's no actual exploration of no. that identity. <laughs> no. It's, it's not easy to get published as a Filipino and that's something I'm struggling with right now. And um, it's um it's not like they don't want the stories but sometimes i feel like they're not ready for the stories they'll say stuff like oh um this isn't something i can relate to like uh, or this isn't something that um that i believe so for instance you know when i when i'm writing usually what i'm writing about is um reunification because that is the major thing that impacts our community here 
because um, so in Canada, a lot of our population here is be- has come because of the caregiver program. Mm-hmm. So the Prinais, they come here first as, as nannies or as, uh, working with seniors. And then afterwards, then they can sponsor their families to come. Families to come. And so often it's like maybe six to eight years on average uh, that they're separated from their families. And that, I think those, those years are really impact a student like academically, socially, um, especially in terms of like family life, how will they feel like they belong. And so that oftentimes that is what I write about. And when you bring that to, you know, um, some white publishers and they say, oh, it's, um, it's so sad that you're writing this because, you know, every Filipino I know is so happy. Filipinos are always smiling. <laughs> they love singing and dancing. Why aren't you writing about that? And you're like, how am I going to write a book with no conflict? Like, that's <laughs> and also, we don't just sing and dance. Maybe that's when you see us the most. Um, but that's not all we do. And so that is really a struggle up here in, uh, in Canada. Mm-hmm. Oh, like that idea of the Filipino, of us Filipinos being happy all the time, being hospitable, as something right. that is like an image that's like pre-imposed on us already. It and, is. and it's like, you know, it's like breaking that fourth wall of some of us, um, need to discuss more on how do we overcome that and how can we as you said generally like we need more role models to sort of um guide like the future generations our generation to to be more open to like taking more risks in in writing and creative um careers and it's you know, like your work is honestly just, it's really, really, really amazing to hear about how you are trying to represent Filipino, um, the Filipino identity and culture in a way that is very ingrained with like, you know, the education system as well. And um, it's some, I'm just trying to think of a parallel to here in the UK, that it's only starting to become more recognized in amongst um, like academics here and within the local Filipino community. Like I do know a professor who's working on um, trying to get the Tagalog as a a GCSE, as a high school sort of uh, like, uh, how do I say it, Troy? How do I say it? Like high school qualification. Yeah, high school qualification. (laughs) Um, And that's like in the talks and it's, I think it's those you know, just like small steps, baby steps like that is something that's like really truly inspiring as well. Because if I wish I had a high school qualification in Tagalog, you know, something it would it would um it would be, it would be like definitely like good for the future generations as well. How can we like get the younger generations in the Filipino diaspora to be more engaged with culture and art history, with yeah. art and history? Oh, that's such a good like, question. Um, yeah. Here, I have my bookcase here. One of our Pluma members, uh, his name is Eric. He is a teacher by day and by night he's made this. This is the first Filipino-Canadian activity book. And I was the editor of this. And he's, he said, you know, it's not fair that um, students get activity books that are mostly, you know, of a Western orientation. So how come we can't, like, teach the kids about you know, the legend of the Ten Datus, how come we can't teach them about Lapu Lapu? Why don't we teach them about Ati Atihan? And so he was really saying, you know, this is not, it's not okay that we don't have this kind of thing. And even like to teach them by writing. Wow. So that way it's not just a tattoo when they're later on in life, but <laughs> they can actually read it. And that would be great. So um, that is something that um, we've been promoting really hard here in Canada because we think, well, why not, right? Especially now, there's so many students stuck at home, right? With the homeschooling, oh. that would be a great time to learn about your history as a Filipino. Also, I love how it's a visual form as well. So, mm, love yeah, the graphics, a, love the It's a pretty book, yeah. It's a, it's a fun looking book. And basically the idea is that you should be proud of where you and your family are from. And I think that's true, especially now in Canada, like we're on, um, we're on like the 
fourth generation now. Some of some families, some of the older families. And you know, as lo the longer that we're here, the farther we get from you know, the, our source of like what what is Filipino and it gets to the point later on where you just think okay Filipino is karaoke, lumpia, <laughs> basketball <laughs> and that's basically it and so we've been trying really hard to make sure we don't lose like our origin story yeah for the kids yeah do you think that decon like this idea of deconstruction and from what we were talking about with Carlo like decolonialization Mm -hmm. um, uh, how can we like introduce that more into maybe your own initiative, like Filipino Talks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So for Filipino Talks, so I talked to you about the teacher, the teacher parts. Uh, so what I also do is maybe three or four presentations only with the students. So we got all the Filipino students and some teachers are amazing. They let, even let the kids skip class so they can hang out with me. <laughs> and like as part of their classwork, they, they, will, they will do that. And um, so what, so role models, right, was the main, was the main issue that we found in our, our research study. And so I thought, okay, there's, there's going to be three different types of role models that we bring in. So it's called Filipino Talks because it's a series of talk shows. It's not just me on a stage because that would be so boring for them. I wouldn't want to put them through that. <laughs> so there's three talk shows. So the first talk show is about reunification. So I'll find like usually some university students or recent graduates who have gone through reunification with their moms. And now like they're, they're finding their way in the world and like they have really good leadership capabilities and like community organization um, responsibilities. And so those will be part of the talk show. One, second talk show is role models in the community because a lot of the Filipino students are not involved with their community at all. Especially the newcomers, they just, either their parents don't think it's important or they just don't know where they can start. So we'll bring in all these ates and kuyas from different community organizations. So that way they can meet them and find out, okay, who can help me with employment? Who can help me, you know, find uh, like cooking classes? Who can help my parents get, um, get whatever they need in Canada so that way they can get bridging programs, go back to school. Um, and then the last talk show is about professionals. So I'll ask the students, who do you want to meet and what do you want to be when you grow up? And usually it's like a doctor, um, a lawyer, an engineer, and then something creative, usually a, like a dancer, a singer, or a choreographer, something like that. And so I'll bring in Pinoy's that are in all of those different professions and we'll do a talk show for the kids so that way. And then we do like breakout sessions. So that way, even the ones that are, you know, the most shy kids, at least they can have like maybe really small groups with each different uh, role model. So that way they don't have that scariness of being in front of all the different, all like 60 kids and asking questions, but they can just be in a small group with those role models. Yeah. Yeah. So that is part of like the decolonization is that they have to find role models that look like them. So Filipino talks, we, I really try to push like the noise in front of them for weeks. <laughs> so that way there's no way you can't say you've never seen someone that looks like you in the positions you want. Yeah. And you know who can help you get there and that they're Pinoy too. Is that sort of like a difficulty then, like finding these Pinoy's in different professions? How? No, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's really nice. Um, I, I'm so grateful that I live in Toronto now because it's really a very strong community. About role models is such an important thing that there needs to be more, you know, more exploration into different career paths and, um, you know, getting the younger generation to be more engaged with that as well. So yeah, thank you so much, Jen Lee, for <laughs> telling us about um, your Writers Collective and Filipino Talks. We need people like you, Carlo and Jen Lee, to continue, um, you know, recording history, writing about their Filipino experience and sharing it to others. And I think Philly Fest is a great platform for this as well, because it's that potential of you know, just engaging with like back with our culture and doing so in a way that's open-minded and not limited to this single concept of being Filipino, but understanding that there are so many nuances to the Filipino identity, whether in the diaspora or whether in the national context, as we heard from Carlos' research. 
Thank you so much for being here. I enjoyed myself. I enjoyed talking with you and learning more about about you guys, your experiences and your perspectives. And yeah, that's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jess, for hosting such a thought-provoking and interesting discussion on Filipino identity. And thank you to the panel members. Stay tuned because we've got performances lined up at 2 p.m.